Toyota returns the Corolla name to the family hatchback segment with a more class competitive hybrid focused model lineup of hatches, saloons, and estates. If you'd previously dismissed the Japanese brand as an also ran in the focus class, it might be time to think again. Why would you change the name of the world's best selling automotive model line? The reasons are difficult to understand, yet that's exactly what Toyota did back in 2007, switching the badging of its volume family hatchback model from Corolla to Auris. Now, though, the Corolla name is back. Indeed, for Toyota, it's like it's never been away. The brand describes this as the 12th generation model. The Corolla badging issue was clearly contentious within Toyota. This car was actually launched at the 2018 Geneva Motor Show as an Auris, then rebranded three months later before production models actually hit the showrooms. Perhaps the company realised that it would never have a better opportunity to return to its family hatchback's much respected original model name than this, with an all new platform and completely fresh engineering adopted here. The Corolla lineage is certainly impressive. It's still the world's most successful automotive model nameplate, dating back to 1966, since when 46 million cars have been produced. Away from naming semantics, there's much of interest here, not least the fact that the primary engines offered are petrol-electric hybrids. There are three body styles this time round too, a saloon variant joining this five-door hatch and the alternative Touring Sports Estate. All are built on the new TNGA, or Toyota New Global Architecture platform. And the hatch and estate are constructed at the brand's British factory in Burniston, Derbyshire. The company wants to enter fresh territory here. For one thing, it needs to make hybrids more universally acceptable in this segment. And that's why there are two of them this time round. A 1.8 and a 2 litre unit, both of the self-charging, non-plugging variety. It also aims to change customer perceptions of Toyota in this sector, which tend to centre around expectations of drab interior quality, forgettable looks and boring drive dynamics. This Corolla, we're promised, is a huge step forward from its Auris predecessor in all of these areas. But will all that be enough to at last make this Japanese maker competitive at the sharp end of this class amongst focuses and golfs? Time to find out. Right, to driving impressions. It's going to be much easier here if we think of this Corolla as a predominantly hybrid product. There is a conventional engine option in this car, a 116 horsepower, 1.2 litre petrol turbo, exclusively mated to manual transmission, but Toyota will offer it to you with about as much enthusiasm as McDonald's will sell you a salad. Which is why nine out of 10 Corolla buyers will want an electrified version of this model. With good reason, because the hybrid proposition with this car is vastly improved over what was provided by its forgettable Auris predecessor. It still baffles us that there aren't any other self-charging petrol electric options in the family hatchback class, but one possible reason why is that to date the technology hasn't been especially driver friendly. On previous Prius or Auris hybrid models, the slightest serious brush on the throttle sent the revs rocketing skywards without much appreciable forward motion. If you were content to amble about like Miss Marple, everything was fine. But if you needed to push on, Toyota's Synergy Drive setup could be frustrating and nothing like as economical as advertised. It would be inaccurate to say that everything's different in that regard here, but it's certainly much better as you'd expect it would be given that Toyota's hybrid technology is now in its fourth generation. At long last, the brand has dispensed with ancient nickel metal hydride battery technology for hatch and estate versions of this car at least, and introduced a new 216 volt NICAD lithium iron battery that's smaller, lighter, and can deliver more power to assist the engine thanks to improved recuperation capabilities. The petrol engine in question for most buyers of this car will be the 1.8 litre unit we're trying here, which works with the 53 kilowatt 600 volt electric motor to generate a combined system output of 122 horsepower. 
That recipe might sound pretty similar to that of the old Auris hybrid, but the power plant on offer here is now a much cleverer unit. There's an increased valve angle for a better fuel and air mix, plus it can switch at will between intake and direct injection to prioritise either performance or economy. Toyota says it's worked hard to better mate this package with the belt-driven CVT auto gearbox that all its hybrids have to have, pointing to the way that greater torque from the electric motor should now provide a more linear increase in revs under acceleration. And sure enough, if you've owned one of the brand's petrol electric models before, you'll notice that this one is more drivable. But the whole point here is to garner conquest sales from customers previously used to a small diesel. These folk will still have to adapt to the way that big throttle inputs cause a flare of revs that the setup initially struggles to translate into rapid forward movement. And they'll also still need to accept a vast reduction in mid-range pulling power. This engine's very modest 142 newton meters of torque output is about 40% down on what you get from a typical 1.5 or 1.6 litre rival small diesel unit. Something you'll really notice in give and take motoring. Overtakes have to be planned much further in advance. You won't really appreciate the reality of that merely from perusing the rest to 62 mile an hour sprint stat rated at 10.9 seconds, 1.6 seconds slower than the conventional 1.2 litre petrol turbo Corolla variant. But the 1.8 litre hybrid engine's limitations are more evident from the feeble 112 mile an hour top speed that applies to both petrol electric versions of this car. Yes, with this car, unlike with the Prius or the old Bowers, you get more than one in developing this Corolla. Toyota reckoned that volume buyers would be satisfied with the 1.8 litre hybrid unit we've just been talking about. But the brand also recognised the need for a gutsier hybrid option further up the range. An engine better able to adapt itself to an occasional need for urgent acceleration and offer the kind of performance that would allow pricier versions of this car to target larger capacity 2 litre diesels in the family hatchback class. Hence the 2 litre hybrid powertrain that we suggest you also consider if you're sold on the thought of this car. Toyota says this larger capacity unit provides a more energised drive, as you'd hope it would given that power output rises to 180 horsepower. And we've also been trying it as part of this test. It's a pity you can only have this engine at the priciest end of the range, because for us it's a much more complete proposition. Partly because of its extra grunts, but mainly because the link between accelerator position, revs and actual performance is far better matched. Here, Toyota's efforts to suppress engine response to sharp throttle inputs and create a more linear response by putting the initial burden on the powerful electric motor have borne more fruit. The single speed transaxle matches engine speed with acceleration more convincingly and you no longer have to spend so much time with the accelerator rammed against its bump stops when you're running late for wherever it is you've got to be. For reference, the rest to 62 mile an hour time is rated at 7.9 seconds, half a second faster than a Volkswagen Golf 2 litre TDI, but more relevant is the huge improvement in response in the 30 to 50 mile an hour overtaking increment that makes the car feel so much more flexible and spontaneously powerful on faster roads. Don't misunderstand us, a 2 litre hybrid Corolla is still way down on the level of pulling power a black pump fuelled engine would produce with a 190 newton meter figure that's almost 50% less than a comparable 2 litre diesel. But you notice the shortfall much less than you do with a 1.8 litre hybrid, even though you still have to compensate for it and the CVT transmission's occasional uncertainty remains sometimes annoying. If Toyota were to use a dual clutch auto gearbox with proper cogs rather than the CVT setup's rubber belt as part of its hybrid powertrain, as for example Hyundai's Ionic does, we can't help thinking that this issue would be far better resolved. Still, the brand has tried to offer buyers of the 2-litre hybrid model more of the kind of feel you'd get from a conventional mechanical gearbox by equipping the CVT setup in this variant with six virtual gear ratios programmed into the epicyclic drivetrain. You can scroll through them using steering wheel paddles, but you probably won't want to because these are rather artificial, both in feel and response. 
better is the drive mode select driving mode system that all Corollas now get, the sports setting of which offers up more urgent acceleration. The other modes are normal and eco. Stay in sport and you'll get a much better feel for the considerable dynamic improvements that have been made to Toyota's family hatchback contender this time around. The adoption of the brand's latest GAC platform and the use of ultra-high tensile steel has resulted in a huge 60% improvement in chassis stiffness, which allows the suspension to work better in terms of handling as well as neutralising sharper bumps. Those new underpinnings have lowered the centre of gravity by 10 millimetres, which is partly why cornering body roll has been reduced. And at the wheel, you feel a heightened sense of purpose by the way that the improved driving position places you 24 millimetres closer to the ground. It might all encourage you to throw the car into the odd corner just to see what happens. And if you do, you'll find that though this Corolla is no focus, it far from disgraces itself with a decent level of front end grip and steering that's predictable and accurate, though rather light. The brakes seem better than previous Toyota hybrids we've tried too, more effectively combining friction and regeneration retardation, though they aren't particularly smooth, especially at low speeds. It all leaves us with a package that not only looks different from anything the brand has previously offered in this segment, but absolutely is. In the past, Toyota hybrids were usually unwilling to adapt themselves to the way that typical owners sometimes wanted to use them. In this Corolla, things have changed a little to a small extent with this 1.8 litre unit and to a much greater one with the 2 litre version. And the result is a car with an appeal that extends way beyond the merely eco-minded, exactly as Toyota intended it should. The Corolla nameplate may have been globally successful over half a century, but it's never been applied to a really good-looking family hatch until now. Helped by the flexibility of this new model's GAC platform, which allows for a reduction in roof height and a significantly lower bonnet, Toyota stylists have made this car sleeker, sharper looking and altogether more appealing in every way than the frumpy Auris model it replaces. This Corolla is 30 millimetres wider and 25 millimetres lower than that car and 40 millimetres longer too, which positions it somewhere between a Golf and a Focus in terms of overall length. Toyota's proud too of the way that it's been able to give the three available body styles their own distinct personalities. Partly that's because the two alternative variants to this hatch sit on a wheelbase that's been significantly lengthened by 60 millimetres. There's a Turkish built saloon which will be a very rare sight in our market and is only being reintroduced here to placate the few folk who miss the brand's now discontinued mid-sized Avensis sedan. More relevant is the Touring Sports Estate we've also been trying. A Europe-only model designed in Belgium and sharing many elements of the elegant sporting silhouette that now features on this hatch. Let's take a look at that in more detail. Now, from the side here, you get a real feel for the way that Toyota's new global architecture platform sits the powertrain 10 millimetres lower for a commensurate drop in the car's centre of gravity. The ultra-short overhangs are also notable, as is the unusual mid-level panel creasing. This sees this upward swage line that flows back from the front wheel arch take a sharp upward turn just before the C-pillar. At the same time as a new shorter crease just below starts above the rear door handle to emphasise the more powerful haunches. A lower level crease gives the panels some further shape and separates arches housing bigger wheels than Toyota has previously fitted to a car of this class. The rims suiting the current trend by varying in size from 16 to 18 inches. We've got the largest ones here. With certain colours on this hatch version, you can also specify a bicolour finish that coats the roof, the front and rear pillars and the door mirror casings in metallic black. So you've got the idea, Toyota's family hatch is no longer content to blend into the street side landscape. A change of attitude you're made particularly aware of here 
at the front, where the nose has gained a notable dose of overtaking presence. The narrow upper grille, set beneath the curved front edge of a flatter clamshell bonnet, incorporates slimmer, sharper, all-LED headlight units with integrated daytime running lights. Further down, the trapezoidal lower grille has a smart mesh finishing, a vertical angle and shaping styled around the look of a catamaran hull, a signature of current Toyota design. Plusher variants like this one also get jewel-like LED fog lights embedded into its outer corners. The rear is also cleanly styled, if perhaps not quite as distinctive. There's a more rounded style than was evident with the previous Auris model, made possible by the use of a resin material for the tailgate, which allows the fabrication of more complex curves. These complemented by a 14 degree increase in the rear screen angle. The all LED rear lamp clusters have light guides located as far out towards the vehicle's edge as possible to emphasize its wider stance. And the lower part of the bumper styling echoes the catamaran theme of the front, while further up, all models get this neat roof spoiler with a shark fin style aerial just beyond. Of course, as usual, what's more important is the stuff you can't see. Though the door and roof panels bonded to that new GAC platform are thinner than those of the Auris to reduce weight, extra spot welding and structural changes have delivered an impressive 60% improvement in body rigidity over that previous model. OK, let's take a look inside. Now, despite the lower stance, this car's actually easier to get into than Toyota's previous contender in this segment because the driver's hit point has been lowered by 24 millimetres. At the wheel, there are more vast improvements in perceived style and quality. The brand still has plenty to learn from rivals like Peugeot and Volkswagen in this regard, but... The company's designers at last appear to be starting to grasp the importance of a premium feeling cabin when it comes to conquest sales. It helps that all the air vents are the same shape this time round. The old Auris had two rectangular and two incongruous looking circular designs. And that old model's ghastly old 70s style LED clock has at last been ditched. And importantly, material quality is considerably better, with copious use of piano black and metallic style surfacing. It's certainly all a big step forward from the low-rent Fisher-Price style plastics that characterise the interiors of previous Toyota family hatchbacks. OK, so the stitched leather style dash finishing that features on this top spec model clearly isn't real hide, but it looks smart and all the key touch points are reassuringly plush. In comparison, a volume spec Focus or Astra feels rather cheap. It's not all about the tinsel either. The cabin's ergonomically improved too, thanks to a reduction in instrument panel height that improves your forward view and a wider center console area that gives the cockpit more of a wraparound feel. Further helping with this perception of greater sophistication is the view you get through the much smarter three-spoke leather stitch wheel, that of a new instrument binnacle that Toyota has chosen to present with a combination of digital and analogue design. Inevitably, that approach is somewhat limiting in terms of screen configurability. This 7-inch TFT central monitor isn't large enough to show anything other than a speedometer with an outer perimeter changing in colour depending on the driving mode you've chosen. But it does have a useful centre section that can show fuel economy, compass, audio and trip computer readouts. As for the analogue gauges that flank this display, well, one curiosity is that this is the first Toyota hybrid we've driven with a rev counter. Normally, in the company's models, that's replaced by the brand's usual hybrid system indicator gauge. You can, though, select a hybrid energy monitor readout in the central screen.
That all works quite well, but Toyota's still got some work to do on its primary infotainment screen technology. A few years back, this 8-inch centre dash display would have been perfectly adequate. But today, systems from most rival brands deliver classier graphics and quicker screen resolution times. At launch, this set-up smartphone mirroring functionality was behind the curve too, but Toyota tells us it has imminent plans to introduce both Apple CarPlay and Android Auto to this car in the near future. With all these points made, we'd say that overall there's not much essentially wrong with the fundamental way that this Toyota Touch 2 infotainment package works. It covers off the usual DAB audio, phone, apps and media options, plus if you avoid entry-level trim there's also navigation too. The standard six-speaker sound system is clear and punchy, and if you like your music, there's a JBL premium setup, optional on volume variants, that comes complete with neat A-pillar speakers. In the screen's info section, there's a larger version of the energy monitor mentioned earlier, which gives you a much better feel at any given time for what's being charged or powered by what. And we like the fact that an incorporated rear view camera is standard fit across the range. On that subject, we'll also mention that above base spec, you get all round parking sensors too. Which is just as well, because the relatively chunky rear pillars mean that over the shoulder vision is less than perfect. Narrow A pillars and the large glass house mean that there are no impediments to your view frontwards though. Plus the designers have moved the door mirrors onto the doors to allow for the fitment of front quarter lights, which improve visibility still further. You enjoy it all from a pretty exemplary driving position, which sees almost everything falling naturally to hand. Toyota's worked hard on the high set seats, which are decently supportive and impressively include powered lumbar adjustment as standard right across the range. Our only comment is that on the chairs that feature with the volume trim levels, side support could be better. For that, you'll need the Shapeplier sport style seats we've got here, which feature wider shoulder supports and come as standard only on top spec XL models. Unfortunately, all the chairs on offer lack the usual twist dial style of uh, backrest adjustment. Instead, you have to use the more inexact method of pulling a rather sharp-edged control lever, then rocking your weight back and forth until you find the right position. On to cabin practicality. Well, you'll most commonly be stashing your phone into this area in front of the gear stick, which is why a USB port is nearby. There are reasonably sized door bins and a large glove box, so Toyota hasn't thought to cool it. Also missing is an overhead sunglasses compartment, nor do you get ticket clips on the sun visors. Two cup holders are provided between the seats with a lidded bin behind that, incorporating a 12 volt port and a further USB point. The bottom trimming for this box, though a flimsy bit of loose felt, reminds you that Toyota still has a way to go before it can offer truly premium levels of cabin quality. Would you get that on a Golf? Or a view of exposed bolt heads when you turn the wheel sharply to left or right? We think not. Time to check out the back seat. Now, earlier we mentioned that this Corolla was longer than Toyota's previous offerings in this segment, but we haven't yet told you that its wheelbase, the crucial determining factor when it comes to rear occupant cabin space, is shorter than key class rivals like the Ford Focus, or at least it is in this hatch model. As we told you earlier, the saloon and touring sports estate derivatives of this design get a longer wheelbase that aims to suit families rather better. We were interested to see if that would leave this volume hatch version a little compromised for occupants at the back. Well, you don't immediately sense any issues when getting in, which is more straightforward than it was with the old Aris, thanks to a hit point lowered by 26 millimetres. Inside, it's fairly tight space-wise by class standards, both in terms of leg and headroom, restrictions rather emphasised by the way the curved roof lining slopes down ahead 
and to the side of you. An element of the area feel you'd ideally want can be preserved on plusher models by paying extra for a large glass panoramic roof, but that features eats up 22 millimetres of much needed headspace. The footwells are also pretty tight with little space between the bottom of the front seats and the base of the rears, making it a little awkward to get out. But the lengthier touring sports estate or saloon versions will suit you much better if that's an issue. Those models aren't any wider than this hatch though, so cramming three adult folk back here is going to be something of a squash, whichever body style you pick. Of course, to some extent, that'll be true whichever car you pick in this class, but some manage significantly better than others. A rival Ford Focus, for instance, is a significant 35 millimeters wider than a Corolla. On the plus side, the transmission tunnel here is quite low, and this time round in this class, Toyota has provided rear vents too. If there are only a couple of you back here, you'll be able to use this fold-down armrest with its twin cup holders. There are outer ISOFIX child seat attachments and seat back pockets. On this hatch model, you don't get door bins, just this door handle recess cubby and this small bottle holder. We'll finish with a look at the cargo area, the roominess of which varies quite a lot, not only with body style, but also with engine choice. In recent years, Toyota's got quite good at packaging its volume 1.8 litre hybrid power plant so that the batteries don't intrude into boot space. That's the engine we've got here, and it has no impact on trunk capacity at all, which is rated at 361 litres, the same as for the conventional 1.2 litre turbo petrol unit. That's a fraction less than you'd get in a Focus or a Golf, but still enough to accommodate up to six carry-on suitcases, which is actually more than you'd be able to fit into a Golf. For touring sports estate, Corolla models fitted with the two engines just mentioned, the capacity figure is 598 litres. The Corolla Saloon, which comes only with the 1.8 hybrid unit, has a 471 litre boot, which incidentally makes its capacity only 38 litres less than you used to get with the brand's old mid-sized Avensis sedan. Bear in mind, though, that if you're choosing a hatch or an estate and you opt for the larger capacity 2-litre hybrid unit you can have with those two body styles, the bigger engine means that there's not enough space for the battery to sit beneath the bonnet, which means it has to intrude into the luggage area design. As a result, on the hatch, boot capacity falls to 313 litres, while on the touring sports version, the figure is 581 litres. What else? Well, there's not much space beneath the base of the luggage area, certainly not enough for a spare wheel. Four tie-down hooks are provided, though, as are cargo sidewall bag hooks. The estate version gets load floor runners, cargo sidewall seat retraction catches and a useful partitioning net, plus a recessed compartment down to the left with a lift-out panel along with a 12-volt socket on the right. On this hatch version, the rear seat backs are retracted by the usual seat back shoulder levers and the backrests fall in the usual 60-40 split, but leave quite a loading step up to negotiate if you're sliding long items in. Rival models deal with this by providing an adjustable height boot floor, but that's not available here. In real terms, Corolla pricing starts from around £24,000, which from launch was the minimum sum required to get the more affordable of the two hybrid engines on offer, the 122 horsepower 1.8 litre unit. It's true that you can save around £2,500 on that figure and get yourself the sole conventional power plant available, an ordinary 116 horsepower turbo petrol 1.2 litre unit, but Toyota thinks that only 10% of buyers will which explains why most Corolla sales will be of models priced in the 25 to £28,000 bracket, or getting on for £30,000 if you go for a top-spec variant like the one we're trying today. In other words, it's clear that the company's aiming for a slightly better heeled family hatchback segment buyer here. Not that Corolla buyers have to have a hatchback. Two other body styles sit on a slightly lengthier version of this model's new GAC platform, the Touring Sports Estate and the Turkish-built Saloon variant. 
That four-door sedan is available only with that 1.8-litre hybrid engine, the one Toyota thinks will be most popular across the lineup. But the British-built hatch and estate versions offer two further power plant options. Choose a hatch or estate with one of the more affordable trim levels, specifically Icon, Icon Tech or Design, and you'll also be offered that conventional petrol 1.2 we just mentioned, available only with six-speed manual transmission. Or if you're looking at a plusher level of trim, specifically Design, or as in this case, Top XL, you'll have the chance to go for a gutsier 180 horsepower, two litre version of the brand's hybrid unit, which sells at a £1,725 premium over the lesser 1.8 litre hybrid. Both hybrids are, as usual, auto only. Once you appreciate all of this, it's clear that magazine talk of Toyota threatening the major players in the family hatchback sector with this car is a bit irrelevant. Not everyone likes the idea of a hybrid. In contrast, quite a few family hatchback buyers still want a diesel, a cheap, conventional, entry-level petrol unit, or the opportunity to aspire to a halo hot hatch derivative, all elements lacking from this Corolla's model lineup. Having said that, the tide is certainly turning in Toyota's direction as more and more buyers in volume market segments reject diesel power and begin to look seriously at electric vehicles and the hybrid option. Diesel sales have fallen by 29% in recent times, at the same time as hybrid sales have risen by 26%, which is significant here because Toyota and its premium brand partner Lexus dominate the hybrid market, currently owning nearly 50% of it. Previously, the company's petrol electric technology could target only smaller diesel engine rivals in cars like this. But the introduction of that bigger two-litre hybrid means that buyers who would normally look at a two-litre diesel can now be prospected too. The Corolla slots into Toyota's model range alongside two similarly sized models that share the same engineering. There's the eco-minded Prius, which is slightly bigger inside than this Corolla hatch, but uses only the 1.8 litre hybrid power plant and costs around £500 more. Or there's the fashionable CHR compact SUV, which is smaller inside than all Corolla variants and costs around £1,200 more. Both of those models have their own distinct appeal, though, so Corolla buyers who haven't graduated on from the previous Auris model will need to be conquested from other brands. Will the pricing Toyota has chosen here help with that? Let's see. First and foremost, if you're making comparisons with more conventional family hatchbacks and you're looking at a hybrid Corolla, you'll need to bear in mind a couple of things. First, that there aren't any other non-plug-in hybrids, or to put it another way, affordable hybrids, in the family hatchback segment. Only Volkswagen's Golf offers petrol electric power in this class, and in that case, you have to have it with plug-in technology, hence an asking price of over £31,000, which puts that Volkswagen well away from price parity with a Corolla. The second thing you'll need to remember is that also only aspect we just mentioned. The fact that an auto gearbox comes as an integral part of the Corolla hybrid package adds a lot of value to it when you consider that auto transmission will be a pricey extra, costing you around £1,500 more on alternative, similarly powerful, conventional petrol or diesel models from other brands. Diesel power is probably a more relevant point of comparison. A conventional petrol engine would leave you way off the kind of efficiency returns you could expect from a Toyota hybrid. As we suggested earlier, the 1.8-litre hybrid unit we've been trying here, the engine that most Corolla buyers will choose, competes primarily with 1.5 and 1.6-litre diesels from rival manufacturers, most of which will slightly better it in terms of combined cycle fuel consumption, but all of which will be way behind this Toyota in terms of CO2 emissions. Let's get to the price comparisons. The cheapest diesel auto option in the family hatchback class is a Renault Megane DCI 115, which will save you around £3,000 over a Corolla 1.8 hybrid. A Seat Leon 
1.6 TDI Auto will save you a similar amount. For a Ford Focus 1.5 EcoBlue, 120 PS Auto, or a Hyundai i30 1.6 CRDI Auto, you'll pay just under £2,000 less than this Corolla. A Honda Civic 1.6i DTEC Auto would cost around £1,500 less, while a Citroen C4 Cactus PureTec 130 Auto would cost around £1,000 less. The cheapest versions of quite a few diesel auto family hatches, though, are priced within just a few hundred pounds of the 1.8 litre hybrid version of this Toyota, including segment big hitters like auto versions of the Volkswagen Golf 1.6 TDI and the Vauxhall Astra 1.6 CDTI. And other key rivals often cost about the same as a volume hybrid Corolla. Here, we're thinking of cars like auto versions of the Skoda Octavia 1.6 TDI, the Mazda 3 Skyactiv D, and the Peugeot 308 Blue HDI 130. For a Mini Clubman Cooper D Auto, you'd actually pay a couple of thousand more than Toyota is asking here. If the rival you're looking at does offer you a saving, you'll need to balance that against the higher tax rates the higher diesel CO2 levels will cost you. Key standard Corolla equipment inclusions like LED headlights, heated front seats and a reversing camera may well narrow the price difference too. We'll briefly cover price comparisons against the two other Corolla engines. If you're looking at Toyota's Pacia 2.0-litre hybrid unit, you'll need a starting budget approaching £28,000, which sounds a lot, but which is actually a fraction less than the only other mainstream diesel auto model in the volume brand family hatchback class, offering around 180 horsepower, Peugeot's 308 2.0-litre Blue HDI 180. For auto 2.0-litre diesel mainstream versions of the Volkswagen Golf or Ford Focus, you'd save just under £2,000 but have access to only 150 horsepower. And with all three of those 2.0-litre diesel models, you'd have to shoulder running costs that would be much higher than those of a 2.0-litre Corolla hybrid. A more relevant rival we'd point you towards is the petrol-powered Skyactiv X version of the Mazda 3, which isn't a hybrid, but can deliver sprightly performance. Combined cycle WLTP rated economy of over 50 miles per gallon and a sub 100 gram per kilometre emissions figure. It's priced at about the same level as those Ford and Volkswagen 2 litre diesel auto models we just mentioned. But even Mazda's Skyactiv X technology, clever as it is, can't offer you the silent urban progress and the sub 90 gram per kilometer CO2 showing of this Toyota. Finally, a word about this Toyota in conventional 1.2 litre petrol turbo form, a variant that we've left until last because, as mentioned earlier, only around 10% of Corolla customers will want it. A starting price for this version, which from launch was pitched from around £21,500, is a touch on the high side for a family hatch with an ordinary petrol engine and around 115 horsepower in this segment, but not massively so. Think 500 to 1000 pounds more than comparably performing segment rivals like the Ford Focus 1 litre 125 PS, the Volkswagen Golf 1 litre TSI, the Peugeot 308 1.2 PureTech 110, a Mazda 3 Skyactiv G, a Vauxhall Astra 1.4 Turbo, or a Honda Civic 1 litre VTEC. You'll save just over 2000 pounds if instead of a 1.2 litre conventional Corolla, you choose an entry-level 1-litre petrol Skoda Octavia or a Citroen C4 Cactus PureTech 110. A base 1-litre petrol Seat Leon or Kia Seed would save you around £3,000, while with a base 1-litre Hyundai i30 or 1.4-litre 120 horsepower Fiat Tipo, you'd save around £4,000. Enough. Let's say that you've considered all the options and having done so, decided that there's nothing quite like a Corolla. An understandable conclusion, given this car's unique hybrid selling proposition. Once you've reached that point, news of generous levels of standard equipment might be enough to seal the deal Toyota's way. So, is that what's provided here? Well, let's see. We've already mentioned a few key Corolla features, LED headlights, heated front seats and a reversing camera. And base icon trim also includes 16-inch alloy wheels, LED 
tail lamps, front fog lamps, a shark fin antenna, an alarm and dusk sensing and manual levelling features for those headlights. On the inside, there's dual zone air conditioning and leather trim for the steering wheel and gear knob. Plus, the front seats feature powered lumbar support. Infotainment's taken care of by an 8-inch Toyota Touch 2 multimedia centre dash display that lets you Bluetooth in your smartphone and provides access to a six-speaker DAB stereo system. There's also a drive mode select driving mode system and an e-call emergency assistance setup. Part of an extensive roster of standard safety kit we'll brief you on in a few minutes time. You can also talk to your dealer about a range of connected services that you'll be able to access via a free downloadable app. These include the kinds of features you'll find from rival brand apps. For instance, send to car navigation, a find my car feature that'll help if you've forgotten where you've parked, and a maintenance reminder. Plus, Toyota has added a driving analytics section and a last mile guidance feature. Getting back to the Corolla trim lineup, the vast majority of buyers will ignore the entry level Icon models and start their perusal of the range from the next rung up in the lineup. Icon Tech spec, if only to get themselves navigation and the 7 inch colour display that makes a big difference to the look and feel of the instrument cluster. An Icon Tech trimmed Corolla also gets some significant other additions. All round parking sensors and an intelligent park assist system to automatically steer the car into spaces. Mid range design spec will be your starting point in the range if you're wanting this larger capacity 2 litre hybrid engine. And this trim level builds upon the Icon Tech Tally by adding in larger 17 inch wheels, black side sills, rain sensing wipers, power folding mirrors, an auto dimming rear view mirror, privacy glass, and brighter LED front fog lamps. Finally, there's the Top XL trim level we have here. That gets you bespoke sports seats with partial leather trim, bi-LED headlights, special interior illumination, a smart entry keyless entry system, and on the hatch, 18-inch alloy wheels. As for extra cost features, well, it's probably worth pointing out that some of the real niceties are restricted to the more expensive models. You have to have chosen design or XL trim to be able to specify a panoramic glass roof, and you can only specify the premium JBL audio system if you've opted for XL trim with the 2-litre hybrid engine. At the other end of the range, if you're limited to base icon trim but want navigation and all-round parking sensors, you can add them in separately. On to aesthetics. Now, unless you want your Corolla in pure white, the only solid colour, you'll need to be paying your dealer more for your choice of metallic or pearlescent paint shade. We've got Eclipse Black here. That, by the way, is the colour that features with the extra cost bitone paint package available to buyers choosing top XL trim. With this, the roof, the front and rear pillars and the door mirror casings get that black finish. But you can only have this option if you want your XL spec Corolla painted in Titan bronze, pearl white, sterling silver or scarlet flare red. There's also a range of optional 16, 17 or 18 inch alloy wheels. What else? Well, you might additionally want the light protection and chrome styling pack, which includes chrome side sills and a front bumper garnish, plus scuff plates, a rear bumper plate and a boot liner. There's also a version of this same pack that swaps the chrome features for black finished elements. The scuff plates, rear bumper plate and boot liner are also included in a full protection pack, which also gives you mud flaps, a cargo net and rubber floor mats. And on the subject of practical features, you can also order a tow bar, which isn't always possible with a hybrid car, a roof rack, roof crossbars, a roof box and a roof mounted bike carrier. Inside, you can fit a universal tablet holder with a docking station onto the front seat backs if you want to use your tablet devices to entertain the kids in the back over long journeys. There's also a removable console storage container ashtray that can be fitted into one of the cup holders between the seats. 
Enough on options. What about the safety standards of this Corolla? Well, they're very high, thanks to fundamental design improvements and to Toyota's decision to include an upgraded second-generation version of its Safety Sense package of camera-driven features as standard across the range. We'll start with the basic design changes, which see body rigidity increased by 60% through widespread use of adhesives, a high number of spot welds and greater use of hot stamped and ultra high tensile steel. There's also a special so-called floating island bonnet in a structure that helps reduce the inertia G-forces at the start of a collision and combines with a cowl louvre impact absorbing structure to mitigate head injuries in the result of a pedestrian impact. It's the extent of the camera features included in the Safety Sense pack, though, standard across the range, that's really impressed us here. As we go through it now, bear in mind that most of the elements either cost extra on rival segment models or can't be had on competitors at all. And most of the features work via this upgraded single lens camera and millimeter wave radar, both embedded here at the top of the windscreen into a unit that's been made very compact so as to give the driver a wider field of vision. Let's talk you through what's on offer. Probably the key inclusion is the brand's pre-collision system autonomous braking setup, now designed to work just as well at night or in situations of poor light, which are, after all, the kinds of conditions in which most accidents take place. Here, the system's radar scans the road ahead in search of potential collision hazards as you drive at speeds between 0 and 112 miles an hour. Like most autonomous braking systems, this one can detect people, animals, solid objects or other vehicles that might stray into your path. And in daylight hours, at between 6 and 50 miles an hour, it can specifically detect errant bicycles too. If an imminent risk of collision is detected, the PCS or pre-collision system will alert the driver and prepare the brakes for maximum pre-collision brake assist stopping force. If the driver fails to act, autonomous emergency braking will be triggered, which can reduce vehicle speed by up to 31 miles an hour, potentially bringing the car to a stop and avoiding an impact. But that's just one of the safety sense features. There are quite a few others. Lane departure alert with steering control, for instance, which lets you know if the car's wandering over road markings. And if it is, will gently apply subtle steering lock to ease you back to where you ought to be in your lane. An additional vehicle sway warning system detects the kind of deviations that happen when a driver starts to lose concentration or become tired. If so, audible and visual warnings are given, recommending that the driver takes a break from the wheel. Next up is automatic high beam, which dips your headlights for you at night to avoid dazzling oncoming vehicles. Then there's RSA or road sign assist, which pictures road signs as you pass and displays them on the dash. This can work in concert with IACC or Intelligent Adaptive Cruise Control, which automatically regulates your speed on the highway to maintain a safe gap to the car in front, varying as necessary to suit speed and congestion. The intelligent bit of the IACC setup relates to the windscreen camera's RSA system ability to recognise new speed limits on major roads. So can, if programmed, automatically adapt your speed to keep within the current limit. You simply click the right switches on the steering wheel. Use that feature and you need never be caught out by a speed camera again. In theory, anyway. In any completely new modern era product of this kind of price these days, you also expect the potential for a degree of autonomous driving support, which this Corolla provides courtesy of its standard LTA or lane tracing assist function. When travelling at speeds above 31 miles an hour, this monitors the line markings on motorways and major routes and applies steering assist to keep the car centred within its lane. This can reduce collision risks and the burden on the driver when making long highway journeys. 
Lane tracing assist is also great for slow or stop-go traffic where it works in concert with the intelligent adaptive cruise control system to track the path of the vehicle in the lane ahead, maintaining a safe distance and speed and bringing your car to a halt when necessary and moving this Toyota off seamlessly when traffic flow resumes. This can relieve a Corolla driver of much of the stress of driving in slow traffic and significantly reduce the risk of common low-speed rear-end collisions. Of course, the Corolla also gets plenty of more conventional safety kit too. Twin front, side and curtain airbags, for example, plus a further airbag for the driver's knees and ISOFIX child seat mounts on the two outer rear seats. On top of that, there's hill start assist control to prevent the car from rolling backwards as you pull away on steep inclines, plus VSC stability control and the usual ABS braking and traction control systems. Every model in the range also comes with a tyre pressure warning system. Finally, we'll cover two standard safety features we think are just as important as the safety sense stuff. The first of these is the PKSB, or Parking Support Brake System, which works with what Toyota calls an ICS, or Intelligent Clearance Sonar. Whilst parking or similar low-speed manoeuvres, the PKSB and ICS functionality allows the car to sense impending obstacles, say a, a low brick wall you haven't noticed. If your Corolla senses you are about to hit the hazard, it will automatically apply the brakes to avoid a collision. That's very useful, as is the safety feature we'll finish with, the eCall emergency system, there to automatically alert the emergency services with your exact GPS location if the airbags go off. It's all very reassuring. We've got to the point where a self-charging, i.e. a non-plug-in hybrid model, costs hardly any more to buy than an equivalent small diesel. But have we also got to the point where such an engine can match or beat its diesel counterpart in terms of real-world fuel economy? Well, let's see. The version of this Corolla that, as we've been saying, most customers will buy, the 1.8-litre hybrid on test here, Manages between 55.4 and 65.9 mpg on combined cycle WLTP tests. That's quite a span, reflecting our experience that official fuel results in a hybrid are much harder to achieve than they are in a diesel. To give you some perspective for a comparable Volkswagen Golf 1.6 TDI DSG Auto, the combined cycle span is 51.4 to 54.3 mpg. And for a Ford Focus 1.5 EcoBlue 120 PS Auto, it's 49.6 to 54.3 mpg. But even if a comparable small diesel family hatch does end up being slightly more economical than an electrified 1.8 litre Corolla, it won't be able to get anywhere near this Toyota's CO2 emissions showing. That's rated at up to 76 grams per kilometre for a 1.8 litre hybrid hatch model on 16 inch wheels. For that Golf model we mentioned, the best official figure is 104 grams per kilometer, while for the Focus it's 109 grams per kilometer. And all that will add up when it comes to your benefit in kind tax status. Let's take a look at that now. A Corolla 1.8 hybrid hatch has a year one BIK tax rating of 19%, which for a typical 40% taxpayer over a three year or 30,000 mile period of ownership will translate into a projected tax liability for the period of £5,837. If, on the other hand, you were to choose that Volkswagen Golf 1.6 TDI DSG auto model we just mentioned, your BIK percentage rating would shoot up to 25%, translating into an increased three-year tax liability of £7,898, which, to save you doing the maths, is £2,061 more. And it'd be a similar story with just about any other 1.5 or 1.6 litre diesel family hatchback model you care to name. You'll do slightly better tax-wise by choosing a rival model with petrol power, but the BIK difference to this Corolla hybrid would still be very significant. And of course, the economy figures from a conventional petrol engine compared to a hybrid would be vastly worse. But that's only part of the story. Take all aspects of your running costs into account and the Corolla's hybrid's advantage over conventionally powered rivals is even greater. 
Independent industry experts cap, compute a TCO or total cost of ownership figure over three years and 30,000 miles, which takes not only taxation into account, but also issues like fuel costs, finance and depreciation. Based on this, CAP reckons that a Corolla 1.8 hybrid hatch would cost £15,462 to run over that three-year period, which is £3,356 less than that Golf diesel rival. Food for thought. Part of the reason the Corolla is able to achieve this showing lies with its extremely high projected residual values. CAP reckons this to be 49.5% for a 1.8 hatch hybrid variant over a three-year or 30,000-mile period as opposed to a segment model average of 38.3%. If you're looking further up the Corolla range, you'll also need to know the figures for the larger capacity 2-litre hybrid engine. For that, you're looking at a WLTP-rated combined consumption span of 50.4 to 60.6 mpg and a CO2 reading for the hatch on 17 or 18-inch wheels of 89 grams per kilometre. Again, we'll give you some class perspective on that. The best you'll do in a Golf 2-litre TDI DSG model is 53.3 mpg and 116 grams per kilometre, while for a Ford Focus, EcoBlue 150 PS Auto is 51.4 mpg and 114 grams per kilometre of CO2. For completion, we'll give you the figures for the conventional 1.2 litre petrol turbo model, up to 47.2 mpg on the WLTP combined cycle and 128 grams per kilometre of CO2 on 16 inch wheels. That's about 10% below the class average for this kind of engine. We were a little surprised to find a rev counter in this car. In its hybrids, Toyota usually replaces that with its usual hybrid system indicator gauge, featuring charge, eco and power sections. Funnily enough, we found the rev counter to be better explanatory as to the beneficial effects of the hybrid synergy drive powertrain. As you drive, you'll find its needle constantly reverting to zeros if you've turned the engine off, as the engine seamlessly disables itself with its EV mode activated and battery power in motion. Toyota, rather ambitiously, reckons that its self-charging hybrid engines are capable of covering up to 50% of a typical daily commuting drive under electric power alone. As usual, on a Toyota hybrid, there's an available EV button that's supposed to fix the car in electrified motion, which on the 2-litre hybrid can apparently take place at up to 70 miles an hour. In reality, though, you'll find that the batteries are hardly ever charged up enough for you to be able to use this feature. And even when you can, it'll only last for just over a mile. The 2-litre setup might do better than the 1.8 because it has more battery cells and can offer more regenerative energy. That battery, by the way, now uses lithium-ion cells, or at least it does with the hatch and estate versions of this model. For reasons Toyota couldn't fully explain to us, the Turkish-built saloon body style sticks with old-fashioned nickel-metal hydride battery cells. Either way, during much of your urban motoring in a Corolla hybrid, say when you're inching along in traffic with the engine seamlessly disabled, the EV mode activated and battery power in motion, you won't be emitting any emissions. At which point, you might like to monitor the hybrid system's cleverness on the energy display you'll find on the center console monitor. The same display also providing graphical trip information and history screens so you can gauge your ongoing success in fuel economy and energy regeneration. At higher speeds, you need to bear in mind that the quoted fuel figures are even more heavily dependent than normal on the driver assuming a significant degree of restraint. Certainly, to get anywhere near even the 40 mpg mark in day-to-day -day use with this Toyota, you'll need to keep the car locked into the drive mode select driving mode systems eco mode, which moderates throttle response and engine power output while tweaking the climate control. We talked about the switch of battery technology that's taken place with the fourth generation version of this hybrid powertrain. That battery pack is now lighter and its power control unit is more compact. Energy losses through the transmission have been reduced, as have engine friction losses, plus heat management has been optimised as part of a far-reaching package of engineering changes, the nerdy details of which we won't trouble you with.
All of this technology might make you worry about this Corolla hybrid model's reliability, but the Prius-derived engineering in use here scores very highly in almost every customer satisfaction survey going, and all models are covered by a five-year, 100,000-mile warranty. Though not quite a match for Kia's seven-year deal, this is a notable improvement on the limiting three-year, 60,000-mile packages you get from brands like Ford, Vauxhall and Volkswagen. Unlike earlier Toyota hybrid models, there's no extended warranty for the hybrid components. Early Priuses were covered for up to eight years. However, after the five-year warranty expires, you can renew it at extra cost for a further year or 10,000 miles, and do so every 12 months up to the 15th anniversary of the car's initial registration provided a hybrid electric service is regularly carried out at a main dealer, Toyota Hybrid Electric Specialist. As standard, Corolla buyers get five years of pan-European roadside breakdown assistance, a three-year paint warranty and 12 years of anti-perforation cover. As for looking after your car, well, routine maintenance is needed every 10,000 miles or 12 months, depending on which comes round soonest. That may be a little frustrating if you're a higher mileage driver. An intermediate service on a Corolla will cost you around £190, with a full service priced at around £340. Hybrid models are subject to extra service checks, but Toyota doesn't charge any more to do it. There's a dedicated My Toyota website that allows you to book a service online, and Toyota has a fixed price servicing plan, so you'll know in advance exactly how much any work will cost before you check into a dealer. You could also take advantage of the optional prepaid service plan that that dealer will offer at point of purchase, this enabling Corolla owners to cover the cost of routine maintenance with monthly or one-off payments in advance. However you go about paying for your maintenance on a Corolla hybrid, it shouldn't cost you very much. After all, there's no starter motor or alternator to go wrong, no drive belts to break, a maintenance-free timing chain, no particulate filter to get clogged up with diesel fumes, and of course, thanks to the CVT auto gearbox, no clutch either. The hybrid setup has a good record for minimising tyre wear and its battery will last the life of the car. Plus, the Regenerative's braking setup helps extend the life of the brake pads. Over 60,000 miles of driving, the front pads should only need replacing once, while the rear pads and all discs will probably last the full distance. What else? Well, those low CO2 emissions figures we mentioned earlier for the hybrid models inevitably translate into equally low vehicle excise duty payments. For the 1.8 hybrid, your first year VED exposure is just £100, followed by the yearly £135 payment that applies to alternative fuel vehicles. By contrast, the first year VED payment needed with the conventionally engined 1.2 litre model will be £210. Finally, we'll tell you about insurance, which doesn't vary with your choice of body style. The 1.8 hybrid models are rated at Group 15. For the 2 litre hybrid, it's Group 21. For the conventional 1.2 litre petrol engine, it's Group 17. So what do we have here? A name from the past which packages up technology from the future. Very soon, all family hatchback class models will feature model lineups that are primarily electrified, but Toyota has brought us that right now. In a car, its volume brand competitors will have to take very seriously indeed. If you're going the hybrid route with a car in this sector, it makes sense to buy into the brand that has most experience in producing this kind of powertrain. And that's unquestionably Toyota. Now that the Japanese maker has been able to bring its hybrid engineering to market for only a fraction more than you'd pay for an equivalent diesel, it's becoming harder and harder to ignore it, especially in an era where black pump fuel is becoming more and more stigmatised. Of course, hybrid technology isn't perfect. Now, for the moment, it can't give you the pulling power of a good diesel, and Toyota has yet to fully perfect the way its CVT auto gearbox works under petrol electric power. As a result, in hybrid versions of this Corolla, you're often left feeling that the confident chassis deserves a more engaging motor. 
But that's only when you're driving this car in a manner beyond its refined comfort zone. Stay within that and there's very little not to like about it, especially now that Toyota can offer you a choice of hybrid power outputs. The conventional 1.2 litre petrol engine option is less convincing and potential buyers are rightly concluding that without electrified technology, the Corolla lacks its most unique selling point. Mind you, that's not to say this car doesn't have other compelling attributes beyond its underbonnet engineering. It's nice to look at, it can offer safety standards that rivals struggle to better and it's well equipped, plus it's British built too. Yes, you'll pay slightly more than you would for most mainstream rivals, but you'll almost certainly get that premium back over time in lower taxation and reduced running costs. Which leaves us saluting Toyota's strongest ever proposition in the family hatchback segment. Because the market for hybrid models still isn't fully formed, the Corolla won't threaten the class leaders in terms of overall sales, but it's probably the cleverest choice you could make in the sector and a massive step forward from its uninspired Auris predecessor. If you're looking for a car in this class, this one probably isn't currently on your shopping list. We think it ought to be.